<laughs> but this, this is a history that goes back right to the founding, in some ways, of the public theater, or at least the founding of the Astor Place with, with hair, chorus line, there's so many, most recently, Fun Home, um, and of course, Hamilton. Could you talk a little bit about the public theater's relationship to musical theater? And, and one of the things you and I were talking about is, is musical theater, is it fair to say, it's in some ways kind of the de facto American form of theater? Uh, what I would say is it's the most American uh, form of theater, and it's the form of theater that we have perfected in a way more than any other. Um, the history of the public is interesting because for the first 14 years of its existence, we were the New York Shakespeare Festival, and the only thing that Joe Papp did was free Shakespeare outdoors in the parks in New York City, all five boroughs, touring around on the back of the flatbed, then settling by the side of the Turtle Pond in Central Park and building Delaware. But what, and it was a magnificent success, and I could spend all afternoon telling you stories about that, but he was just doing Shakespeare, it was the only thing we did. And then what Joe realized, and this is where I think his brilliance really flashed, that the mission of the public was to democratize the culture. And that what he was doing in the back of that flatbed truck and then at the Delacorte was one part of that. It was taking the greatest writer in the history of the English language and offering him up for free to the people of New York. That was an important thing to do. But he realized if it was actually going to fulfill the full democratic potential of our mission, what he needed to do was not just give art to the people, but turn the stage over to the people and let them make the art. And that was when he took over the Astor Place Library. Um, in 1967 and started and opened it as an indoor venue for new work, for new diverse work that would give the, the, the age its form and pressure, that would show the world what we, who we were right now. And the first show he ever did, the opening show October 1967, was Hair. You know, not bad for a guy who had not only never produced a musical, he never produced a contemporary play. And the first thing he did was hair. <laughs> famously, in his nasty review of it, said, it's as if Mr. Papp had just taken a broom and swept up all the refuse of the Lower East Side, which is the stage. <laughs> he blew that up and put it in the lobby. <laughs> That's exactly what it And of course, hair struck this incredible spark. Three, four years later, um, we were touring Shakespeare still through the parks as well as performing at the Del Delacorte. And Mel Shapiro was asked to do a new version of, uh, to do Two Gentlemen of Verona. And there were um, riots going on in the streets, the, the Vietnam War was at its highest, the civil uh, rights movement, and many you know, sparked violent confrontations. And he said, if we put on pumpkin bands and go on and do this musical, uh, or do this Shakespearean comedy in parts of the verse. We're going to get stoned. People are going to hate this. So he asked John Quayle to come in and write some lyrics. And then he asked uh, the hair composer, Gold McDermott, to come and maybe do a few tunes. And when Joe came back from vacation, they made a musical, Two Gentlemen of Verona, which was, uh, Raul Julia was the star of it, and it was playing across uh, all the parts of New York, and then at the Delacorte, and then it moved to Broadway and won the Tony for Best Musical. Um, and then, so, so what, what you're seeing is that the public's musical history is not rooted in a desire to do musicals. It's rooted in a desire to talk about important content to the people of New York and to try to say who we are and what we're doing and to try to make Raoul Julia speak for Shakespeare and for New York, not just for Puerto Ricans. And that reached a kind of climax with Chorus Line a few years later where what the public did, what Joe did, was essentially feed money to Michael Bennett, who'd come in with an idea that he wanted to make a play about not the stars of the musicals, but the backups, the chorus line. They wanted to make a play about those people. He didn't quite know how to do it. And it was probably going to be a musical because it was Michael Bennett. And he started by sitting around at his apartment at midnight, with, after all the shows were down, a group of the gypsies, the chorus dancers, would come over to his apartment, he'd plunk down some bottles of red wine, and they'd talk into tape recorders. And then he brought the tapes to Joe, and Joe listened to the tape and said, yeah, let's do it. And he started supporting this workshop. There's no script, there's no composer, there's no writer at the beginning. And over the course of the next year and a half, what became Chorus Line developed. And so that was the first time, and of course, I'm this kind of successful. <laughs> <laughs> we also played the same theater with my own. 
And what that was, was I think the, the first time that we started to sort of systematize the influence of the nonprofit theater on the American musical, which was that musicals could grow and develop organically in a way that's not completely dissimilar from how plays can be developed. And you don't have to know where you're going. You just have to have an impulse to be an artist. And that the nonprofit theater can create space for that to turn into perfect versions of itself. And basically, since then, that's what we've been trying to do. Janine, to step me back, we, we know you're the Tony Award winning composer of Fun Home, but where did you start? Could you talk a little bit about your start in musical theater and perhaps vis a vis the public where you now have a, you know, a wonderful working relationship? Um, I also like to say the five-time Tony loser. We just have to get that in there. <laughs> All perspectives. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, how, how did I get my start? Yeah, talk a little bit about how you were attracted to, to musical theater and, and perhaps how you um, first connected in with the public as well. Well, I, um, I did not know anything about musical theater growing up. I didn't have a cast album in sight. I, was, I started playing the piano at three. I played Edelweiss about 75 times before my mother said, either I get medication or you get piano lessons. <laughs> and uh, I think both happened. But, uh, so I started studying for real at, at, at six, and I had the thing that raised the pedal because like, my feet couldn't, you know, in those days, that it was just, that's how we studied. I had an incredible piano teacher who um, had me play in the circle of fifths, which is this beautiful system where you just go up five, 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 and you eventually go around the world in, in terms of music. They're doing it with the Philharmonic right next door. And, and he would, I would play TV themes, and I'd play Stravinsky and Kamalewski, and he taught me very early on that music is music, and as long as you respond to it, that is its worth. Its worth isn't in labels that I should never poo-poo a jingle or world music, it was, it, those lessons are embedded. And then I got to um, study with a serious musician for the gifted program, and I loathed it, and I detested it, and I was playing concertos that I didn't understand at 12. And then by the time I was 14, I was on my third. Um, you know, every, I, it was still when I hear, when I smell hairspray, I get, my breath quickens because she had a giant helmet head. <laughs> and she would always look at me and say, we have a, um, what was it, a, a communication problem. And I thought, I hate you. <laughs> 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 you know, what she didn't understand and I didn't understand was that I was a writer, that the piano was a means to an end for me, that I wasn't going to be, you know, I, I played in flip-flops, I kept time by blowing bubbles, and um, they didn't know what to do with me. I was a, a, a girl in music, what do girls do? Well, they play flute, and they play um, violin, but then there was Karen Carpenter, and that chick was out there with her bangs and her drums, and I was like, I want that. And so, you know, those women who were really, I, I thought were really in charge, that was really important to me, so I was on that track, and um, we used to do a lot of concerts when I was, my father was a doctor, we used to do these um, very impromptu, incredibly anxiety-provoking concerts, and during one, I dramatically stood up and said, I shall play no more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, it's like, God, you know. Um, but I showed them I didn't play for five years, and then it wasn't until I was pre-med at Barnard that I switched to the music program at Columbia, and did two years of pre-med and then switched. So by the time that I got to theater at 19, uh, it was just like, you know, getting lost in Central Park. I moved into New York in 79, and my father, who also went to Columbia, forgot to tell me that there was this giant thing called Central Park in the middle. So I wandered one night, 103rd Street, and kept going, and I thought, I'm going to be killed tonight. It's 1979, and I'm in some giant jungle. And then I got to the other side at Fifth Avenue, where the, I don't know if you've ever been there, but the conservative gardens. Oh my god, it was my, the spirit 